Hello, my name is Mariah Hilton, and I will be providing a chapter overview of Chapter 12, Healthcare Information, in the Health Information Management Technology and Applied Approach 6th Edition textbook. So the importance of healthcare information. Now, healthcare information, it is used to monitor the quality of patient care, conduct medical research, and accurately reimburse healthcare organizations. So that's its big importance. Healthcare information is based on personal health data about individuals primarily for provider use in the management of patient care. Now, the sources of health information, they can include the healthcare provider through documentation in the health record, and the individual through the use of a personal health record, your PHR. Now, the databases for secondary usage is mostly for administrative purposes, including determination of payment for services provided, um, measurement of quality performance indicators, and of course, research. Now, data analytics, this is the science of examining raw data with the purpose of drawing conclusions about that information. So the role of data analytics depends on the type of the data that is being captured, reviewed, and used for the purpose of turning them into healthcare information. So healthcare data analytics, this is the practice of using data to make business decisions in healthcare Whereas clinical uh, data analytics, this is the process by which health information is captured, reviewed, and used to measure quality of care provided. So some examples of healthcare data analytics would be your finances. Clinical data analytics, a good example, are your, like your lab values. Now, there are different uh, types of analytics. You have your descriptive, uh, descriptive analytics, which answers the question, you know, of what happened. You have your diagnostic analytics, which answers the question of why did it happen. Predictive analytics answers what will happen. And then prescriptive analytics answers how can we make it happen. Now, here are uh, certain steps that occur to prepare healthcare data for data uh, analysis. The first step is uh, data capture, which helps to ensure that the uh, data is needed, that is needed, is available, and that the data is correct. The second is data provisioning, which ensures that the data is in a format that can be manipulated for data analysis. And then uh, data analysis itself, where data is interpreted, that is a final stage of transforming raw data into meaningful analytics. So some examples of analytics, analytical tools include your um, data visualization, which is typically a graphic display of data that can help uh, the viewer understand the data trend. You have your dashboard, which is um, it's, a, it's a data analytics tool that is a computerized visual display of specific data points. And typically, a dashboard focuses on a process and the rate of achievement. You also have your uh, data capture, which is a process of recording data in a health record system or a database. And then of course, you also have your structured data. Now there are different types of uh, data visual visualization, which include you know, your tables, your charts, and uh, your different types of graphs, which we go over in uh, chapter 13. Now, reviewing a dashboard, this is a, this is different from um, what is called a scorecard. And the scorecard being, um, it is also a type a, of a, a computerized visual display, but it focuses on an outcome or goal achieved, such as like money raised for an event or a cause. Whereas a dashboard involves key indicators, which are quantifiable measures used over time to determine whether some structure process or outcome in the provision of care to a patient supports that high quality performance measured against uh, the best practice criteria. So it can provide metrics and or benchmarks. 
And then health information, per, uh, health information management professionals, we use dashboards to monitor a number of indicators to improve performance and meet uh, quality goals. So uh, data capture, again, this is the process of recording data in a health record system or a, a database. Now, historically, uh, data capture into a health record uh, was via written notes or your traditional voice di dictation that was transcribed and then typed into a paper report. But another uh, method for data capture is scanning documents into electronic uh, document management systems, making it accessible electronically. You also have devices that include traditional keyboard or touchscreen handheld computers, or of course, patient generated health data devices that uh, is another type of tool of data capture. So electronic healthcare data capture, this is a fundamental function of the EHR, your electronic health record. And of course, again, the EHR is an information system with several components and uh, data capture is an element in each component. So the components include, again, those source systems, such as your laboratory information systems, your core clinical EHR system, such as your point of care charting, you got your supporting infrastructure, such as your human computer interfaces, and of course your connectivity systems like your personal health records. Now in point of care charting, the information is entered into the health record at the time and location of the service. Now the outcome of point of care charting, it can be structured or uh, unstructured data. Now because structured data's entry fields are controlled, defined, and limited, it results in discrete data. And discrete data represents uh, separate and distinct values or observations. So in other words, uh, data that contains only finite numbers and have only specified values. Now data capture may also occur with word processing software. So the word processing copy and paste functionality in an EHR system must be carefully monitored and limited or even prohibited to prevent uh, data quality issues. So copy and paste is actually a, a big thing in organizations and it does have to be carefully monitored in case copy and forward causes, again, those quality issues or even errors in documentation. You also have your backend speech recognition, so BESR, and this is a specific use of speech recognition technology in an environment where the recognition process occurs after the completion of dictation by sending voice files through a server. So in a, in a, a backend speech recognition software, an employee edits or corrects the dictation. So I'm mostly familiar with this and it kind of involves traditional uh, transcription services, right? So best example is that a, a provider will utilize uh, the telephone or their cell phone. Uh, they will call in and they will be prompted to put in specific information. And then they will record their entire uh, dictation. And once it's done in the back end, the voice file goes through the speech recognition software to record and um, put it into words. And then from there, the employee will edit or correct the dictation um, pretty much in a nutshell, making it um, free of any uh, grammatical errors or make it look um, like it flows throughout the document. Now on the opposite of that, you have your front end speech recognition software, the FESR. And this is a process where the provider speaks into a microphone or a headset attached to a PC um, and upon speaking, the words are displayed as they are recognized. So pretty much um, the best uh, version that everybody would understand that I, that I give here for front end speech recognition is if you're like texting, but you can't use your keyboard at this time and you actually use uh, your voice to um, provide your text message and you see the words as you're um, talking, that's considered a type of front end front end speech recognition. And then you also have your natural language processing, so the NLP. And this is a technology that converts human language, whether it's structured or unstructured, into data that can be translated and then manipulated by computer systems. 
So moving into data mining, this is extracting and analyzing large volumes of data from a database for the purpose of identifying hidden and sometimes subtle relationships or patterns, and then using those relationships to predict behaviors. So some sources of data, they can come from either a clinical data repository, which is um, a central database that focuses on clinical information, or it can be in the form of a clinical data warehouse that allows access to data from multiple databases and combines the results into a single query and reporting interface. Now, analytics start with data and HIM professionals with their understanding of healthcare data help ensure correct and accurate data is captured. So HIM professionals, they're, we're also proficient in business operations and clinical processes. So AHIMA lists the following knowledge topics as important for data analytics. And these include your data mining, your database queries, your clinical financial and operational data, your classification systems, your healthcare reimbursement methodologies, and of course, several others. So for strategic uses of healthcare information, of course, there are different uses within the information systems that an organization can utilize. Your first being a decision support system, your DSS. This is an information system that gathers data and assists in providing structure to facilitate and improve the ultimate outcome and decision-making tasks associated with non-routine and non-repetitive problems. So a subcategory of this is called a clinical decision support system, so your CDSS. And this is a clinical information systems that is designated to help healthcare providers make knowledge-based clinical decisions. You also have your executive information system, your EIS, and this is a type of a decision support system that facilitates and supports senior managerial decisions. You can also use uh, healthcare information to improve the quality of healthcare by collecting and analyzing the data uh, that assist in compiling quality measurements to report on clinical quality measures. And then of course, information systems can also support research by supplying that health data needed to inform clinical research programs and population and public health surveillance, like COVID. So consumers and healthcare information. Now, consumers, they have become the focus when it comes to healthcare as a result of healthcare reform initiatives. So health informatics, that is the field of information science concerned with the management of all aspects of health data and information through the application of computers and computer technologies. Now, adding consumers to that health informatics, that makes them the focus for that technology that acquires, manages, maintains, and uses the data and information. So there are different kinds, which include like your patient portals, your clinical email communications, any mobile health technologies, your health literacy, and of course your telehealth. So first health literacy, this is the ability of patient to understand health information and healthcare systems. So you have uh, different types of health literacy. You have your a national action plan to improve health literacy. You have your um, PHR, so your personal health record, and of course, your patient portal. Now, HIM professionals uh, support health literacy by ensuring patients' ability to understand and act on health information. We also can educate consumers on the importance of compiling and maintaining that PHR along with what type of information to include and how to obtain the information. And then again, we can also serve as patient advocates by, by educating patients during the initial navigation on that patient portal. Telehealth. So the use of technology to connect a patient and a clinician across a distance is the chief component of telehealth. And telehealth can also be used to send clinical information on the daily status of a patient's health to, physician, to a physician via technology. So some of the benefits of telehealth, they can include 
um, increasing access to quality health care, connecting patients and clinicians across distances, tracks and sends clinical information, it can mon monitor chronic diseases, and of course it could help, help uh, lower healthcare costs. It also allows uh, patients to be active in health-related decisions, whether they are in the short term or the long term. But of course, there's, there's still, we are still overcoming a lot of challenges with, with telehealth. One of the biggest one, uh, the biggest barrier is patient adoption. And it could be just, you know, just a block that some patients have with using technology, their understanding, their understandings of the technology in use to help communicate uh, with the physician and or the healthcare organization. The patient portal, this is an information system that allows consumers to log in to a secure online website to gain access to a personal health information, to, I'm sorry, to personal health information and navigate around it once inside the information system. So some of the functionalities of a patient portal can include, you know, accessing the health record, emailing the healthcare provider, completing any forms necessary before the initial or consecutive appointments. It can also help you schedule an appointment and it can also assist requesting any medication refills. Moving into social media. So regarding consumers, a number of healthcare focused social networks are available to individuals as they come together to interact and receive support from others with similar interests. So online community, online communities, sorry, specific to a condition or a disease, these help provide the consumer with information about the condition and which treatments may have greater success than others. Now providers, they use social media to of course inform consumers about diseases, conditions, and treatments. And then government agencies, they also use social media to inform consumers about healthcare, whether it is um, via apps or video streaming. Your biggest example with social media is COVID. The personal health record, the PHR. This is a record created and managed by an individual in a private, secure, and confidential environment. Now this differs from the electronic health record which is created and managed by the healthcare provider. Data from the PHR is, uh, of course, it's patient-generated health data. So only the patient uh, provides the health data in the PHR. And while there's not a standard set of data and reports to include in the PHR, um, the following uh, examples I'm gonna give, these reports are common to most health records. So it can include your, your demographics, your identification sheet, um, any immediate problem lists, your current medication record, uh, your history and physical, any imaging and x-ray reporting reports, sorry, any lab reports, your uh, immunization records, and of course your advanced directives. Other health information such as exercise and diet plans, health goals um, and home monitoring systems uh, results, sorry, home monitoring system results, such as blood pressure levels, this can also be part of the PHR. Now there are two main types of electronic PHRs. Uh, one being your standalone, which this is where patients fill in information they wanna share with their healthcare provider. And that information is stored on patient computers or through an online system or um, the other being a tethered or connected type of PHR. And this is a type that is linked to a specific healthcare organization's EHR. And then some of the sources of PHRs, of course, they include the patient, the healthcare provider, their employers, or even vendors. Now, with regards to patient safety, sharing the contents of a PHR with providers can enhance existing data, it can fill in information gaps, and of course it can provide a more complete picture of a patient's health, creating an opportunity to improve patient safety. Now PHRs also support telehealth capabilities where access to health information could impact clinical decision making. 
And in a medical emergency situation, a PHR may provide information when the patient can't. Now, some of the impacts of health information exchange, the HIE, it can include, you know, your better quality of care, the improved population health, uh, lowering healthcare costs, decreasing duplicate, pr duplicated procedures, reducing um, imaging, and of course, improving patient safety. Now, health information exchange and health information interoperability, they are not the same. Interoperability is defined as the ability of computers to share information versus the HIE is possible across diverse EHR systems and the information is understood and shared when needed. So there are three key forms of the HIE. First one being is the directed exchange, which is the ability to send and receive secure information electronically between care providers to support coordinated care. So think of the, like the next level of care. The second being uh, a query-based exchange, which is the ability for providers to find and or request information on a patient from other providers, often used for unplanned care. So um, one example being like emergent consultations. And the third being consumer mediated exchange, which is the ability for patients to aggregate and control the use of their health information among providers. Uh, biggest example is your patient portals. Now, of course, there are many benefits to the health information exchange, which can include your enhanced patient care, again, the reduction of duplicate treatments, the achievement of a basic level of interoperability, and of course, to improve transition of care. Now, physicians, laboratories, hospitals, pharmacies, consumers, uh, health, plan health plans and payers, and communities, these are all examples of users of electronically exchanged information. The Health Information Exchange is a nationwide community. The eHealth Exchange um, is, is the name for that nationwide community uh, of exchange partners. And the communities within the healthcare agreed to securely share information via the internet using a common set of standards and specifications. It is the nation's largest health data sharing network. So some of the components of an e-health exchange include your one unified, trusted, operational and legal framework. It provides a governance model. It uh, has operating policies and procedures. It provides technical services. And of course it has operational support. Now, when it comes to patient identity and the HIE, integrity is of prime importance to linking the patient to the correct information. The ability to match patients and health information begins with complete and accurate data collection. So it, it does create that challenge when that doesn't occur. And then of course you have uh, data standards that are agreed upon specifications for the values acceptable for specific data fields. So because data standards, they can vary by different healthcare organizations, that also provides another challenge for the HIE. And the different types of data standards, you know, you have your different vocabulary, code sets and terminology, the content and the structure, the type of transport, and of course the type of services. So some of the uh, health information management professional roles in the health information exchange um, they can include help defining the data exchange model, developing guidelines for data stewardship and data governance. And of course, we help identify strategies to ensure accurate patient uh, identity. And some of the roles, um, actual specific roles could include um, your patient portal representative, being a consumer advocate, you can be a PHR liaison, so a personal health record liaison. You can be a, a care coordinator and even a patient information coordinator. This concludes our overview of Chapter 12, Healthcare Information.